Hello, guys. So today is our last class, and you are all morning students. You are not confused on the time and date of the exam. Am I right? Your exam will take place when? It will take place tomorrow on Friday from 1 to 3. Is it clear? Tomorrow from 1 to 3. Do you know where you go to take the exam? Correct? Tomorrow it's from 1 to my open map. You have to have a profile. You had a profile. You look, make sure you can log in. Make sure you are prepared to uh, do the work. You received my last email, correct? In the morning, you received my warning, correct? Uh, and again, guys, uh, people underestimate what can happen. And last semester, 11 people underestimated what would happen. 11 people failed. And of course, some of those 11 people uh, tried to lie to me that they are innocent and whatnot, which annoyed me tremendously. Even some of them did it in a very, very annoying way. And that's a secret. Okay, uh, I have uh, a way to catch and not just me. If I catch you, it's, uh, you know, I'm pretty lenient. If the department catches you, it's much worse. Good. So uh, do not uh, create a situation, guys. If you are smart enough to cheat on this exam, you're definitely smart enough to not need to do that. Good. If you, if, if, if the slightest infraction on this final exam, I will fail you. Not just for the final, I will fail the entire, uh, you, I will fail you for the entire course. Do you understand? So we don't have any misunderstandings like I did last semester. That's why I'm warning you so sternly. Please don't do it. It really annoys me, it really upsets me, it really uh, spoils my mood. Do not do it. Take the final, take the score, do, uh, do as you can, I will help you. Yes, I'm grading your uh, first exam. You will uh, be notified, I will send you by email your uh, graded exam and results. So sorry that it takes me a long time. With computers, it takes me, um, about three times as long as I would if it were printed on paper. It's much, uh, it slows me down. Now, guys, another thing. So I want, I'm not sure if you covered it or not, but uh, there is a, a topic called Fundamental Theorem of Calculus. It's an important topic for uh, mathematics in general, and it is within the review emphasized within at least a few questions. Do you want to go over that topic or do you, you do, right? That's why I assembled you here. I'm going to try to teach you that topic, guys. Okay, and that, so it is, and then what, what to do next? I don't know. So, okay, let's, uh, let's go over that topic and try to understand it. And then if you have more questions, I will do my best, guys. We, we don't have a time limit today as much as before. I will do my best to stay longer, even though uh, some person wants to uh, say goodbye to me. <clears throat> you see, I got so excited, I forgot we are not in statistics, and uh, so here we go. So here is what we talked about, guys. So those integrals, the integration shortcuts, we know that, uh, uh, that uh, instead of doing the Riemann sum, you see, what is this supposed to mean? So if I uh, take, for instance, here is, how I, uh, here is uh, what an integral means by definition. So an integral, for instance, from zero to two of x squared dx, guys, yes? By definition, this would be what? So I take the limit where n goes to infinity of the summation where k starts at 1 to n of 0 plus k times 2 over n squared times 2 over n. You understand how I was able to write it down, correct? 
I just uh, took the interval from zero to two. I divided it into n blocks. Over each block, each block is very thin. That's why I take n to infinity. That makes uh, two over n is the thickness of the block. It makes it hair thin. And I have lots of them. So together, those very thin skyscrapers fall, fall the sky, they form the skyline x squared. Yes? So this means what? It means sum all the areas of rectangles. This x squared times dx, x squared is the height of the rectangle at position x, dx is its thickness, and just add them up. You understand? That's what this is uh, telling us to do. And, and uh, here is a procedure by which I accomplished that. So that becomes, for instance, limit as n goes to infinity. And I, here I can factor out, let's say, 2 over n cubed. And it becomes summation k1 to n of k squared. And because we have a formula for how to sum k squared, that is a limit as n goes to infinity, 2 over n cubed. And here we have, uh, and here we have, <clears throat> And here we have n, n plus 1 to n plus 1 divided by 6. And then if I, if I take the limit, I can see this is 2 times 2 divided by, uh, uh, by 6. So it's, it's 2 cubed times 2 divided by 6. And all I'm getting is 2 cubed over 3. I, you can see guys, if you understand it, you can do even Riemann sums very fast. But as some of you are aware, I mean, it seems that we have a shortcut. The shortcut is uh, that the integral from zero to two of x squared dx, I can just uh, take the antiderivative and evaluate from zero Two two. You agree? I can take the antiderivative, evaluate from zero to two, and the result is one third two cubed. One third two cubed. So this is just we practice that the shortcut, guys. Could you just for a moment uh, calculate, let's say, what do you think is this? Integral from minus one to one of one over x squared dx. What is uh, the answer? You can do it any which way you like. <clears throat> so guys come on what takes you a while i'm asking you just to, whichever way you like just tell me what's the integral all right so uh, i have three answers Jahin, uh, you disagree with them and you say a lot of them are writing minus two. Jahin, are, and you're writing two. Do you write two because that's what you think it is? Okay. Uh, 
And let me tell, uh, take a class photograph to remember you. Uh, I place it on the wall afterwards in a frame to remember why I will go to hell. All right, so uh, a lot of you, thank you for your responses, guys. Uh, so if you use a shortcut, you will get minus x to the minus one. And if you evaluate it from minus one to one, you will get minus two, just like many of you have written. But it appears to be a very wrong conclusion because look at it, guys, uh, we are adding segments that are going to infinity. Do you agree? We're adding a bunch of uh, segments uh, here, the boxes. If we interpret this as, as to mean area uh, under the curve, we are seeing uh, that the areas are big, very positive and big. So it, it, we might be worried that uh, this minus two is incorrect. And of course, what's the interpretation uh, of that minus two? You see, the point is the shortcut guys will fail you in situations where you don't understand why the shortcut works or doesn't work. You understand the shortcut has a meaning for it. And uh, to understand the meaning, let's try to understand uh, the meaning of it, guys. Suppose that uh, uh, you are trying to deal with the following problem. You are trying to uh, measure the elevation, the elevation of, uh, or the average elevation of a particular uh, landscape. Do you understand what that means? No, Francis, you're supposed to answer on the exam, answer the question as is asked. Uh, short, long way, my point is you need to know uh, what, why something, what something means that really helps uh, avoiding mistakes. If you understand, guys, my only point is this, don't do anything long way, that's, that's never my point, right? The point is, is that if you know where you're going or what's the target, if you truly understand it, you can actually get there without too much effort. You can be there right away or get there in the most efficient way possible. Whereas if you don't understand, you're just, you're, you're confined to walk one particular path. Right? So, uh, so guys, here is the question that we are asking. I hope you understand it. Suppose that you have to survey the, uh, a certain landscape for construction and you have to measure distance to the bedrock, right? So here is a, um, you have, uh, you have this earth ground and x-axis is the bedrock and you want to measure the average distance to the bedrock. How will you accomplish that? Well, this landscape, it appears to be continuous. Do you agree? This landscape is a continuous curve, which means if you take two measurements that are very close together, the uh, value f of x that you will get is very similar. So, this is the way we're going to do that, guys. We are going to uh, divide the interval from A, B into N parts, yes, into N parts. Uh, and the N is a very large number so that we, we take successive measurements very close together. And we are going to add those measures up and take the average, do you understand? So uh, in mathematical notation, what I'm going to do is I'm going to take this interval, subdivide it into n parts, and then I will just uh, take the summation. So I'll take f of x1 plus f of x2 all the way to plus f of xn, and I'll divide it by n, which in Riemann notation, in, in this uh, sigma notation, can be written as k1 to n f of xk times uh, one over n. Do you agree? That's going to represent the average of, of that landscape. I just take a lot of uh, sample points, a lot of altitudes f, and I will average them. Yes? 
And uh, so now you're going to help me guys uh, figure something. So uh, this is uh, the location of first point at which I average, second point uh, and all the way to the nth point. So uh, the formula for the average will be one over n summation f of a k b minus a over n. Yes, again, guys, uh, the average of the function over the interval f average uh, over the interval a b is uh, going to be limit as n goes to infinity of the summation k1 to n f a plus k uh, f a k b minus a over n times one over n. Please confirm that you understand how I established this formula. Completely understood? Right, why if you did? You see the goal, uh, you might be wondering why, this, why is this goal useful, but it, it, let's say that was your task, average. Right, so take lots of points. This is integration, Muhammad. Yes, do you understand or not? Average, guys, what do you do when you average? You just take, uh, you add those things together and uh, divide by total number of things added. Do you understand? I didn't, well, wait, 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 I'm just asking uh, what is uh, the uh, average? What's the, what shape it has? Do you understand my argument so far? Or not, guys, you don't understand why you're quiet. You say Y or you say N, it's very simple. You press Y or you press N and I see if you understood the explanation so far. Not how to calculate it, not, uh, not anything except just uh, the task is to find the average over that landscape to bedrock. You add up all those uh, test values, all those sample FXN, and divide by the total number of samples taken. Do you understand it? All right, and then, uh, and then look at this formula, guys. What does this formula remind you of? Look at this formula, what does it remind you of? Why does it remind, look at it guys. All the semester, the, all, the thing that we always have to do is just recognize, well, have we dealt with that before? I know we haven't talked about integration a long time. We talked about derivatives all the time, but uh, look at this, there's this summation. What does it remind you of? When you integrate, what, does it, what do you do? you add up areas of rectangles. Do you agree? When you integrate, you add up areas of rectangles of height F at the test point times the thickness. What does it remind you of? It should remind you of integration. It's very similar to the formula we have for integration. What's missing? This is the main question. What's missing here for this to look like integration? Can you tell me? Type in the comments the one part that is missing here. Summation? No, so this is summation. This is a, a summation before taking the limit. The width, uh, okay, uh, Jahin explained very specifically which part, what is missing, the width. Uh, you can give me a precise description of it. It's over, the interval is from A to B. Exactly, very good Jahin. And how, and what is missing in the one over N? Do 
Very good. Here, one person recognizes. Look at it. If I place B minus A, if I place here, guys, look at it. If I were to write here B minus A, and then of course, because I never had it, I will multiply by one over B minus A. Do you see what happens? Now, this is simply the definition. Uh, this is one over B minus A, the integral from A to B, fx dx. Do you understand how I move the symbols here, guys? So in other words, uh, in other words, the average is like uh, the integral divided by the length of the interval. Again, guys, integration is very easy to, uh, to understand and remember. What is this uh, symbol? This uh, symbol is for summation. You, are you with me? It's a symbol for summation. If you understand what summation is doing, you understand pretty much everything about integration. Okay, it's very, it's a, it's a particular type of sum. Usually the dx is just the width of uh, the rectangle. So it's a very particular type of sum, nothing more. So for instance, uh, why is this formula true? If you have f of x dx and uh, I, uh, I have a c here, why is this true? This is true because uh, you can factor a constant out of a sum, right? So it's like a factor out of the parentheses or factor back in. So, uh, so this is essentially like, uh, like, you know, f of x1 times c dx plus c f of x2 dx, you know, that's the idea. And this is just the same thing, but where c is factored. You understand? There is a limit that you take it. I mean, it's a limit of a sum. So the reason we have the two symbols, this is a, a, a symbol for a finite sum. And when you take the limit, you use this S symbol to remind you of where it comes from. But the limit is not changing too much about the properties of sum. That's the point. So it's very, very useful to think what the object is doing. And when you understand that, then it's much harder to be confused. Those are tremendously important ideas, guys. I say so, uh, tremendously important. I mean, I, I cannot even emphasize what, how many amazing things uh, you can do with them. So for instance, well, it doesn't matter, but uh, for my probability students, for instance, uh, they were assigned to figure out, uh, uh, ah, whatever, I, I, I don't have it uh, on my, on my, I didn't post it on my website, but, uh, but yeah, whatever. I don't want to distract you from, from it. It just, it, it just pains me that uh, you don't understand uh, how much a common sum can do guys, how many truly deep ideas you can uh, accomplish with it. So there is a question in my probability exam, it's, it's about cheating, in fact, right? So it's about cheating and to uh, deal with cheating, it's actually a mathematical question about it. So here we go. So this is now, now guys, uh, this is what the formula we have and now I would like us to try to carry uh, those limits, okay, guys, without doing any calculation. Without doing any calculation. I want you to tell me A, what's the limit as H goes to zero of one over H integral from zero to H X squared plus two. Without any calculation whatsoever, tell me what's the answer. Very good, Christina. Very good, Junaid. I'm glad that some of you read or thought about the lectures. Come on, guys. Can you uh, can you figure it out? The answer is two. Now, do you understand why what what this thing is, guys? This thing is the 
average of this function x squared plus two. And because h is going to zero, it's the average in the vicinity of zero. Do you understand? So the interval is very close to zero, which means that because the function is continuous, all the altitudes are very similar to the altitude at zero. Do you understand what I, how I'm reasoning? So guys, you see, the function is continuous. If, uh, if my, the points x in the interval are very close to zero, then f of x, in other words, x squared plus two will be very similar to just uh, zero squared plus two because the function is continuous. And what am I doing with this limit? I'm calculating average. So I right away know the average has to be, uh, because I'm adding up the same, the same value pretty much, right? I'm essentially adding f of zero plus f of zero plus f of zero and dividing by total numbers. So the answer is zero squared plus two or two. Do you get it, right? Why if you get it? Without any calculation, I was able to do that because I understand it's an average and I understand that continuity uh, will bring, if, if, if h is very small, continuity will make almost all the points, uh, almost all the values f of the same elevation. Could you then do the same for b, guys? What is uh, this limit for b? Look at this value. What's the limit at b? Okay. Of this function, guys, one over h. Now what happens? You can see that uh, uh, sine x over x as uh, if, if, if x is very close to zero, sine x over x is going to be one, nearly one, you agree? So the average here, and this is just one over h, it's just the length of the interval, it's very similar to the average. So this is the average of this function close to, uh, uh, close to zero, yes? So that would be one, do you get it? Si if h is, if the interval is very close to zero, so h is very close to zero. So sine h over, over uh, sine x over x is uh, x is very close to zero because x is between zero and h, which means sine x over x is very close to one. And so we are essentially averaging one. We're just adding one plus one plus one many times and dividing by the total number of adding one. Good. Next question, guys. Uh, C, please. It's a bit, maybe a bit more difficult. Be careful. What's the answer for C?
Okay. 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 Two people are answering. Three people. Very good. So look at it, guys. Uh, look at this expression for this limit. What's missing here? Can you tell me before you do anything, what would you have preferred to see here? Small modification. Here I have it over here. The small modification is two, because look at it, this interval is of length two h. You see it's h minus minus h, it's two h. So I want to divide by the length of the interval to make it average, do you understand? So I want to see one over two h because the length of the interval must be dividing the integral to make it average. So I then have the average and I multiply it by two, but what's the average? Look at it, tangent of five X over X. If X is very close to zero, this is very close to five. So this uh, average is very close to five. So it's two times five and that gives us 10. Are you with me guys? The average is very nearly 10. You see, notice that here it was five and, and the point at zero was five. So it is equal to uh, F of zero times two. Now, what about this case, guys? Can you tell me what to do with question D, please? What's the situation there? What is this limit? So why takes, okay, one person only said, uh, what's the situation here? Look at it, guys. We have, uh, we have several things. We have uh, at zero, it's zero, right? So first of all, we want to make it look like an average. We want to make it look like an average. So what do we want to introduce here? We want to introduce a three here and multiply by three. Do you see why I introduced the three guys? Because, uh, it, uh, because the length of the interval is, is, uh, is 3h. Now what happens guys, what am I averaging? So uh, this function e to the sine of 6x over 3x is very similar to e squared, do you agree? Very similar to e squared uh, when x is close to zero. And so if h is close to zero, the interval is short and uh, e to that power is close to e to the power of two. Do you see that? Sine of uh, 6x over 3x, it's about uh, two. Yes, so it's very close to, so there are billions upon billions of e squares 
and one point that looks like zero. Do you think the outlier zero is going to affect the average? It's like you have, um, you know, millions upon millions of uh, uh, giants and one dwarf, right? The one dwarf is not going to be visible in the average. Yes? So uh, this limit, this limit is uh, simply what? It's three. It's three multiplied by E squared. 3 is squared. I hope you understand why, guys. It's very simple, right? Just if you, understand, you have intuition on average, it's, it's really biased towards the commonality, towards what's common, towards uh, things that are frequent. It's very not biased. Uh, oh, sorry, it's very, yes, it, 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 it basically does not notice uh, outliers, things that are rare. Right? Uh, sin x uh, uh, over 3x, remember what's the limit? So, sine of, an, of a small angle divided by uh, the small angle is essentially 1, which means that if uh, x is very small, sine of 6x is like 6x, because if x is small, 6x is small, and sine of small angle doesn't do much, so it's as if I don't see a sign there. So I see 6x over 3x. Do you see the idea? So from knowing that limit of a, a, an angle divided by a sine of an angle divided by an angle is equal to one, that means that sine does not do much to the angle if the angle is small. Everybody is clear? That's how it turns into three x over six x or over three x, because sine is essentially not there. So the answer is e squared, but the, don't forget that you have you 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 divided it by h, so you put a three and a three, so the answer is three e squared because it was not, the limit itself was not an average. If you put a three, you make it an average. If you, put, if you multiply it by a third, it becomes the average. So it's really three times the average. And the average was e squared. Why what? Why is it three times the average? Because uh, uh, it must be the length of the integral must be dividing. Now the length of the integral is three h minus zero, but I divide only by h, so I need to put a three here. So I want to divide by the full length. Then this thing is the average. And times three is uh, the limit I need. I'm not getting rid of anything. I am just, uh, I'm just, I just know that if I have one over three H, the integral from zero to three H, I know that in this form that, uh, that what I am asked is to find the average. I'm not using the formula to do anything. I'm just, because I know something about the average, I can go around uh, the formula. You see guys, uh, what you do in mathematics. The point is you don't solve using this. Is you, if you understand what is communicated to you, you can perform the same task using an entirely different method, right? I mean, you, you, in the limit, you know what the average is, so you don't need to do anything. You actually, you'll know the answer. I know that if h is very small, one over three h integral of zero, three h f of x dx, without doing any operations, I know the answer is very close to e squared. Good? So now uh, we are ready for the fundamental theorem of calculus. I hope you are very excited. So there are two parts to the fundamental theorem of calculus, guys. One part is uh, which functions actually have antiderivatives we know how to find antiderivative of cosine. But can you find the antiderivative of e to the minus x squared or of cosine of x squared? Do those functions even have antiderivatives? That's the question. And the fundamental theorem of calculus answers that question. Now, uh, the fundamental theorem of calculus, just as you imagine by, the, by its name, it is tremendously important. It is at the heart of uh, conservation of momentum and conservation of energy in physics. It is at the heart of uh, procedures that you use in probability theory and pretty much anything you can uh, think of. So before we address it, guys, we are going to uh, define, um, which I call the cake function or the cake cutting function. Okay, and it's a different uh, type of, remember before we had an integral, 
where uh, the bounds were for numbers. Here is a number and here is a number. Now what I'm going to do, giving, uh, given uh, uh, the curve y equal f of x, and look at it carefully. I will try to explain why I make that strange change. I will define capital F of X to be the integral from A to X. F of T, look at it, I change X to a different letter. F of T dt. In other words, I make X uh, the upper bound, the upper volume. Okay, now in Calc 1, this is, uh, this is going to be uh, the situation. You see guys, so here is the uh, one dimensional cake. If you go to Calc 3, you would have more dimensions to the cake. But in Calc 1, uh, it's, uh, it, it's this, it's this uh, plain cake and one slice is made at A and uh, the other point you're gonna say, well, let me cut my cake here at X, cut the cake at X and uh, you get that region and then calculate the area of that region given that point X, you understand? So given the point X, calculate the area of the region. Of course, if the curve dips below the x-axis, it is not area because uh, then f of x is negative, right? It's negative area if it dips below the x-axis. But uh, let's see what we can get from it. Okay. All right, guys, I would like you uh, to tell me what uh, what is if you understood? So it's 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 basically you're worried about your weight and you are telling your aunt Aunt Jemima that baked you a cake. You are telling her how much cake are you going to eat. So she sliced one point at one point A, and uh, she will slice at the point X that you give, that you specify to her. So guys, tell tell me in human language, human language. Do you understand what I mean? If you say Aunt Jemima. Please x equal a. What are you asking? In in terms of uh, you're in a bakery and you say please uh, x equal a. I'll have x equal a. What does it mean? What are you asking for? Very good. Very good, Zakaria. Very good, uh, Humira. Exactly. It means no, thank you. I'm not hungry. I will have zero cake. Everybody understands? Now let's let's try to see why that's the situation. Okay, Francis. No worries. Uh, we need to we need to understand what uh, those those symbols mean. Look at it, guys. If I say integral from a, this is my function. Integral from A to X, F of T dt. What am I saying? I'm really saying limit as N goes to infinity, summation K equal one to N, F A plus K, here we have X minus A divided by N, that's the length of the interval. You agree? Times uh, x minus a divided by n. Guys, I hope I, I'm right. I know we spend little time on integration, but I hope you realize why this formula works. I mean, all it is is just a procedure by which I take the interval from a to x, I cut the interval into small segments, and I add up height of the function times, times the width of the interval. Yes? So X minus A over N is the width of one segment of that, uh, the interval that I subdivided. Do you agree? That's what it means. Now, what happens if you uh, ask for A? Let's say, give me F A. Then you are saying limit as N goes to infinity. K1 to N, F A plus K A minus A divided by N times a minus a divided by n, do you agree? And uh, what is that? This is simply limit as n goes to infinity, summation k1 to n, f of a, because this is zero, times uh, zero. So you're adding zero width, right? You have, you're adding f of a, 
multiplied by zero many times in the limit, but it doesn't matter. You're just multiplying by an actual zero. So you're adding zeros. Are you with me? Guys, are you with me? So first you can imagine that if the interval uh, is zero from A to A, the interval is zero, there is no area. Secondly, if you apply the, this limit definition, you see that you are just uh, not, uh, the, the rectangles have no width. So it's, it's height times zero width. So if you add those rectangles with zero width, you get zero area. Do you agree? I hope you understand. Now guys, a much more sensitive question, right? So now you are telling dear Anjamaima, dear Anjamaima, please X equal to B where B is smaller than A. What are you asking? Please, Anjamaima, please B less than A. Well, I don't know. Whatever is A, just uh, please B less than A. What are you asking? Exactly, the rule. You are precisely right. It means you need to be maybe going to a hospital because you're bulimic. You're asking Aunt Jemima to take uh, two fingers and stick it in your mouth and make you vomit cake. You're asking negative cake. You're asking uh, her to remove some cake from your stomach. Now, let me explain why. How do you, uh, how do you uh, understand that? Very simple guys, you have, to, you, you have to understand what the integral means. So let's try to say, suppose that, uh, uh, that f of x, just, uh, just uh, I'm gonna give it with numbers. Would you prefer numbers? I'll, I'll make numbers, okay? F doesn't really matter here. So maybe I, I, I will even give you f if you prefer. I don't know what, how that's supposed to help. But, uh, uh, but look at it. So suppose that I have here and the number is one and here the number is two. Uh, and sorry, and here the number is X. X and the function is T squared DT, okay? So what uh, happens if I'm gonna say uh, X equal to zero? So for instance, what is F of zero? f of zero, guys, is uh, the integral from one to zero, t squared dt, yes? Now, if you just apply the shortcut, that's uh, one third t cubed evaluated from one to zero, and uh, that is uh, one third zero cubed minus one third one cubed, so the result is minus one third one cubed. So it's less than zero, it's negative. You see, if you ask for a number that is smaller than a, you are asking for negative the integral. Now I use the shortcut, I can do something else. I mean, why is that uh, by definition, guys? Why is that, what, I mean, shortcut, we haven't verified that the shortcut works. We don't understand the shortcut. We just applied it like dummies, right? Now uh, we are trying to now using this function to really understand why the shortcut should, should work. That's the main goal of the fundamental theorem of calculus. Now, here is what happens in general. Okay? Suppose that uh, f of x is equal to the integral from a to x f of t dt for any uh, function like this, right? And then suppose that b is less than a. So then f of b is the integral from a to b f t dt, yes? which is by definition limit as n goes to infinity summation k equal one to n f a plus k b minus a divided by n times b minus a divided by n. 
Now, do you understand? Here I'm assuming B is smaller. So it's the, this is the correct uh, position of B. B is here and A is here. You understand? B is smaller. So A minus, uh, so, so uh, B minus A is a negative number. Do you agree? I can make it into a positive number this way. So it's limit as n goes to infinity. And here I can convert the sum one to n, f, here I can write a minus k, a minus b over n. Here I can write a minus b over n, but I place a negative in front. Yes? Now, do you recognize this uh, uh, Riemann sum, guys? What am I actually doing? What I'm actually doing in this Riemann sum is that I'm constructing the rectangles uh, this way. You agree? I am moving uh, minus k uh, times a positive number, so I'm moving backwards. I am moving, you see, you can move from the left point to the right point, or you can move from the right to the left point. Do you get it? Confirm that you understand, guys. If you understand what the formulas are telling you to do, then it's very easy. You, you understand how to interpret them. And that's what you do in mathematics. You're not just following the formula blindly, just like you're not following a road. You can pick your road. You have this uh, freedom to pick the road you want to walk on. Good. So uh, this becomes what? So this is the formula for minus the integral from B to A F T D T. So you see the negative comes in. So that means that I can change the bounds of integration. I can flip them. And uh, if I flip them and multiply by a minus, I will not change the meaning. You understand? The integral, so, so in other words, what this is saying, guys, what, I, what this is saying in a concrete example, remember what we just calculated before. We, we, we calculated the integral one to zero t squared dt versus the integral from zero to one t squared dt, yes? So what, what, what we know is that the integral from one to zero t squared dt is simply minus the integral from zero to one t squared dt. In general, regardless of, uh, of uh, which number is bigger, I can always uh, change the bounds of integration. I can swap bottom to top and top to bottom and multiply by minus one, and that will not change the meaning of the integral. You understand? Good. Very important idea, guys. You happy? And here is what we have here, right? So now, guys, uh, uh, we have the following, obse following observation, which I will do fast. I don't want to do Riemann sums with you, but that's why it's, you need to know them. You see, we're kind of trying to to go through this idea that we are discovering how the shortcut is working, right? We haven't observed it yet, but we are discovering, right? So suppose this function is f of x equal to x, and I'm then converting it to zero to x t dt. Basically, I'm trying to find the relationship between this function and that function, okay? Now let's look at it, guys. I carry the Riemann sum, and I get that capital F of x is just one half x squared. Do you see that? If I, if I calculate it using a Riemann sum, look at it. This function is x and this function is integral from zero to x t dt. When I carry the Riemann sum for capital F of x, here it is, I will arrive that the, uh, at the answer one half x squared. So actually capital F is an antiderivative. Not every antiderivative, but a particular antiderivative of the integrand function. You see, the cake function is, the, is an antiderivative of uh, the crust of the cake function. You see, so crust of the cake, guys, is, uh, you see what I'm saying? Uh, in this example, this, is the, this f is the crust of the cake, and the cake function, the thing that calculates its area, happens to be the antiderivative. So the area under the curve is the antiderivative of the curve. That's what we're trying to notice. And I'm sorry to spoil your fun to tell you that observation beforehand, yes? But you calculate it uh, on several examples. For x cubed, you calculate it, you will find that capital F of x for x cubed happens to be, uh, for x squared, I'm sorry, happens to be one third x cubed. You see, I carry the Riemann sum calculation, it happens to be one third x cubed. 
because I'm, I, I can do that pretty fast, guys. I mean, then you hopefully can as well. You can take the Riemann sum directly, take the limit, and you see it's an antiderivative. And if you do that for, uh, for the next example, for, uh, uh, for f of x equal to x cubed, and compare to the, so this is my crust, and this is my cake function. The cake function happens to be an antiderivative. Here I carry it, and, and I carry it cal the calculation for several other examples. And in each of the examples I selected, doing it by Riemann sum, I find it's an antiderivative. You with me? Now, now I'm gonna try to explain to you why I don't need to really do a particular example. I know that I will always find that the cake function is an antiderivative of the crust. In other words, the area under the curve uh, function is always an antiderivative for the full area. Sorry, the area under the curve function is always an antiderivative uh, of the curve. That's what I'm saying. Yes? Isn't it interesting? Yes? Area under the curve is the antiderivative of the curve. Now, why is that the case, guys? Again, we, sp we spend so much time doing derivatives. Let's try to uh, calculate uh, the derivative of the cake function. So let's suppose we have little f of x. Uh, little f of x, let's suppose it's continuous. And then the cake function for that little f is, is the same function that I integrate, but I change t and I make x the, uh, the upper bound. I will later explain why I changed the t, guys. It's a technical issue. It's not conceptual, it's just technical, okay? But you understand how I make the uh, cake function? I just take the same function f, I change it to t, and I integrate. Let me just, uh, before I continue, verify that you uh, understand uh, how to do that change, right? So, so uh, I call it the crust function, so crust. is f of x equal to uh, to cosine x, okay? Now, cake function can be something like the integral from zero to x, and here I just take the same function cosine, but I'll use t, I'll use a different letter. Could be t, could be anything, but it's not x. You follow? I will later explain why I changed to the t, but uh, let's say we do this thing, okay? That's the cake function. This is uh, the way I define the cake function. And you will see that it happens that if you take the derivative of this cake function, you will get uh, the crust. If you take the derivative of the area of the cake, you will get the crust of the cake. Okay, clear? Now, how am I, why, why is that going to be the situation? Let me try to explain. Well, when we do not know the derivative of something, we, uh, we try to do it by definition. So the definition of the derivative of capital F is uh, in terms of H, it's F, capital F X plus H minus capital F of X divided by H, do you agree? which I can also write as one over H, capital F of X plus H minus capital F of X. Now, what is uh, this, guys? This is the integral from A to this value, integral from A to X plus H of the function minus the integral from A to X of the function. Are you with me? Now, this step, guys, do you understand how I go from this step to that step? How did I do what, Francis? Uh, I apply the definition of the derivative, and uh, do you see the definition of the derivative uh, is one over h multiplied by the difference of f at x plus h minus capital F at x. And then I interpret what's capital F, it's this, and what's capital F of x, it's this. Yes? Now, could do you understand this next step, guys? Do you understand how I combined it? So now it's the area uh, between A and uh, X plus H. I mean, uh, X is in between. So it's really like uh, from A 
Do you understand the simplification or perhaps uh, uh, you do not? I think you do not, right? You see guys that, uh, let me open a parallel document. Here is uh, why that's true. Here, guys. So, first look at it, guys. The integral from a to b of fx dx is the integral from a to an intermediary point c plus the integral from C to B. And uh, in terms of areas, that's clear when C is between A and B. Do you agree? Look at it. Here is A, here is uh, C, and here is B. If C is between them, so this region is the integral from A to C, plus this region integral from C to B, they together add up to the integral from A to B. Please confirm that it's clear uh, up to this point with this picture, that I can take an intermediary point and break it. As it happens, guys, let me surprise you that the point C does not have to be between A and B for this to be true. It will be working with any point C, no matter where you pick it. Yes? I don't even need to worry that it's between or not. It always works and I'll explain now why. Look at it, guys. Suppose that C is below A. In other words, C is somewhere here. You see, if, it's, if C is between A and B, it's just uh, this region plus this region, right? So it's just a summation. Sum up all the way to C and then sum from C onwards. That's clear, yes? Because integration is just sum. I hope, guys, it's very, very clear, very obvious. Now, what happens if C is below A? If C is below A, then the integral from A to C uh, plus uh, C to B is what? Look at it. From A to C, it means I'm walking backwards. From A to C, I'm walking backwards. Do you agree? So the integral from A to C can be written as, uh, because it's, in other words, C should be on the bottom. So I can write it as minus integral from C to A. Do you agree? I can always switch uh, so that uh, I, I can multiply by minus and switch the bounds of integration. Swap them to, to, to be precise, right? I can do this by multiplying by minus. You agree? So. C should be the bottom number if C is below A. So this, uh, rigid, this, this integral I can write minus C to A f of x dx. And now this integral from, uh, now for this integral, A is between uh, C and B. You see, A is between C and B. So I can break it based on this picture. I can break it as the integral from C to A and then from A to B. And look what happens, C to A, minus C to A, those cross out, and I get the integral from A to B, f of x dx. Did you follow my argument? Right, if C is, is below, that means I'm walking backwards to C, and then I'm walking from C all the way to B. Now what happens if I'm walking backwards? Walking backwards produces negative the integral from uh, walking forwards from C to A. And then the second part, because C is, uh, is, is uh, so A is between C and B, I can use the previous idea to split uh, the integral from C to B into C to A plus uh, A to B. And then uh, this and that, they cancel each other. And I get the integral from A to B. You follow? And if C is to the right, it's the rightmost point, then B is between them. So then the integral from A to C, from A to C, can be split as the integral from A to B and B to C. You see, the, the first part can be split from A to B and then from B to C by, just, uh, by applying this idea. And then the last part, the integral is uh, from C to B, can be written as, uh, the as minus the integral from B to C. And again, I can cross this part out and I'm left with integral from A to B. Good? It's pretty amazing. I hope you uh, recognize it, guys. There is in this lecture, I'll keep it open. There are some small things I haven't touched and I would, we would go there hopefully today to completely finish everything. But uh, I need it for my fundamental theorem of calculus, you agree?
This is that fundamental theorem. Do you see that I can uh, look at it? This minus that, it's like from A to the intermediary point is, uh, is A, right? So, that's the, so, so, that, so basically this integral, the first integral can be split into integral from A to X of the function plus the integral from X to X plus H of the function minus the second part is integral from a to x of the function so they cross out and i'm left with this piece which is what you see over here agreed so it's one over h x plus x to x plus h of f of t dt now what's the limit guys what's the limit of this expression it's just the average do you agree this is the formula of the average that we just saw before and what's the average of a continuous function if h is very close to zero? The average, the, the length of this interval is h. So what's the average going to approach? It's going to approach f of x. So I just verified that the derivative of capital F is little f. Are you with me? Write le the letter y uh, to confirm that you are with me, guys. I'm hoping it's not overwhelming. It should be easy and impressive and uh, we see that. Yes. Now guys, uh, do you see what, what was the idea truly? Why, is, why would somebody come with such a clever idea? Well, look at it very carefully. Uh, if, if I'm looking at the integral from x to x plus h, if I just look at the, the way the function is designed is that when you take the difference of the function, you get this area. And this area is very much like a rectangle. And the area of a rectangle is very much like uh, the altitude at, at x, which is f of x, times the width of the rectangle, which is h. And if I multiply it by 1 over h, I'll get back the function f of x. That's the idea. It only works for continuous functions. You understand uh, that's going to be that will give us the idea the, fund the fundamental theorem of calculus tells us how to deal with continuous functions and it tells us in particular that any continuous function has an antiderivative because i can always construct the cake function so even if i cannot find a very nice and simple formula uh, the cake function will be an antiderivative of a continuous function It is the inverse process of derivative, yes. It is the inverse process of derivative. I hope you understood this proof, guys. That's so um, essential. You see, guys, uh, well, how is it essential? You see, uh, it's not because you're solving some stupid shortcut problems. It's like, let's say, uh, it, it makes a huge difference if you actually apply it. So, because what you can do if you understand this process, you can come up with formulas that you never saw before. And that's, and that's the point. Uh, you, you constantly, when you do mathematics, you come, with, you come up with formulas that uh, nobody ever taught you, that you not, never saw before. It could be that nobody saw before, and uh, that's what you do. And it gives you a, a very great facility to use this, uh, to, those tools. You understand why they work, you can use them very well. So here is uh, how the shortcut, why the shortcut is working, guys. You see? Let me try to explain. So uh, suppose I want to integrate the function from zero to three x squared dx. Instead of uh, working with this, uh, instead of working with this, I'm going to create a function and the function is from zero to x t squared dt. And I am interested in evaluating the function at three, do you agree? It's basically this is the same as evaluating this function at three. Now, why, what, what, what's, what's useful about, uh, about this integration procedure? So I know that capital F is an antiderivative. You follow? I, I, I mean, I can try, I'm going to try to come up with a simple formula for this function without going through Riemann sums. Try to take it in, guys. So if you understood the proof, the derivative of this function is x squared. The derivative of this function is x squared, which means, guys, that, the, uh, that this function written in this strange way must be capital F of x 
equal to some one third x cubed plus c. I know it's one third x cubed plus a constant because all antiderivatives must be this way. You see, because I know it's an antiderivative of x squared, it must have, you see, to be an antiderivative uh, of another function, it must be that, uh, that its shape is the same. The shape of the graph is the same. Do you agree? The only way two functions have the same derivative is if the shape is the same because the uh, derivative is just measuring slopes at different points. So they, they, they enclose information about the shape and the plus C is just because the function can be higher or lower. Do you understand that? Yes? Guys, confirm that you understand that uh, uh, there is no other possibility that if the, that, that all functions uh, all, all antiderivatives must be alike. They must have very similar formulas. Yes, because the, because antiderivative means the, the, the shape of the curve. If you take derivative at any point, it must be a particular line segment. Another point, a particular line segment. So the shape is determined by the derivative. If I know that the derivative of two function is the same, they must have the same shape. Because derivatives means that at, at a particular point x, they have this slope. And the other function might have uh, a line representing it just not at the same location, up or down. That's the only difference. So what happens is uh, simply, uh, I need to figure out uh, which particular uh, function is it. I, 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 I need to know which particular antiderivative is it. And so I need to know what is c. And so what do I do? I plug in zero. I know this function evaluated at zero is equal to zero. Yes. And if I plug zero, I get one third zero cube plus C, which is C, which means uh, the function is exactly one third X cubed. And so F of three is one third three cubed. You see? So what I did is instead of taking Riemann sums, I realized that this function is an antiderivative. And then I look at all antiderivatives and I find one that works. Here is the general situation, guys. If uh, uh, this is the area function and it's equal to uh, integral from a to x f of t dt, by the fundamental theorem of calculus, the derivative of the area function will be uh, the crossed function. And so if I imagine I was able to, uh, to find another antiderivative, a simple formula for some antiderivative. So that means that uh, the area function is uh, some antiderivative plus C. And this is a simple formula for an antiderivative. Yes? Plus C. So then I need to figure out what is C. So the only value for which this part is easy to calculate is if I plug in little a because at little a it's from a to a it's zero so i plug in little a and i get that uh, zero is equal to this other antiderivative plus c and that means that other uh, that point c must equal to minus capital f a from which what do you get from which you get that this uh, uh, that this area function is the other antiderivative you were able to find minus minus uh, the uh, antiderivative evaluated at a that's the shortcut you see that's the, exactly the shortcut that we established okay let me try to explain again guys with a concrete example what is the shortcut okay and how this idea works imagine guys uh, that i ask you to do this imagine that your task would be to calculate the integral from let's say pi over two Oh, let's not use power two, let's use pi over three. Let's say the integral is from pi over three to pi over two of cosine x dx. Imagine this is what you uh, had to do, okay? And now we're going to try to understand what the shortcut is doing. Are you ready? So here is step one, look at it guys. So step one, you think, oh, I'm going to define uh, this function. I'm going to define function capital Fx. And I'm going to write pi over 3. And here I write x. And here I write cosine t dt. Are you, are you following me? 
you of course guys when you do the calculations if it's just to do a calculation you don't do that i'm trying to explain to you what the why, why the shortcut works you see so this is what we have here and uh, uh i want to know capital f at pi over two because if i plug pi over two here it will give me exactly this uh integral yes so that's what I do. So now uh, two by fundamental theorem of calculus, by the fundamental theorem of calculus, the derivative of this function is what, please? Could you type in the comments, what's the derivative of this function specifically? which is in this case, what? And I, I might, there is a specific function. So what's the derivative of the function? Very good. It is cosine. Yes. So it's cosine. So that means three. Hence, uh, hence capital f of x must be uh, sine x plus c. This particular function must be sine, whatever the formula must be sine plus something else. You follow? Because I know the derivative of sine is cosine. So there are two ideas that are extremely important, guys. You have to understand that all antiderivatives must be very similar. So if I have, uh, if I found one antiderivative, the others are essentially not different. That, and that's because the derivative describes how on the graph is the line segment position, right? Derivative is the slope of the line segment. So you understand? So I can imagine moving the line. So, and, and the derivative tells me how the line segment is oriented over a particular X. So that tells me that all um, antiderivatives must have the same shape of curve. They are parallel curves. Do you see that? Because over a particular X, uh, if this is the derivative for one antiderivative, so this, this is the slope, then over another one, it must have the same slope because the derivative for both of them is the same. So uh, it's, a, it's a bunch of uh, wavy lines that are parallel. So, I hope you follow guys, I really do, right? I really hope you, when I say wavy lines, I just wonder how much imagination are you, do you have, do you have it in your mind? Do you imagine what I'm saying or it's just noise? Because I actually imagine how the, this thing is built. Do you? I know you do, Christian, all right? If not guys, I mean, you let me know if something, I can draw your pictures, I can try again, right? But uh, you have to play videos in your mind for this to do anything. So f of x is sine x plus c. So I want to know which specific c. So what, what number am I gonna plug in? So I'm gonna plug a number. I'm gonna say f evaluated at what number, guys? Where, where, where is it very easy to evaluate this function? There is only one value for which it's very easy. Tell me what that value. Why zero, you see, that's why I'm asking guys, why, why zero? Maybe you're giving me the solution, but uh, what value can I plug instead of X to, uh, to right away know uh, the value of capital F? There is only one value. Pi over what? From here to here must be the same value, pi over three. So if I plug pi over three, I will get zero. But plugging in pi over three into, uh, into uh, this function, it's gonna be sine of pi over three plus a constant. And what's sine of pi over three? This is, uh, uh, well, just let's keep it a sine of pi over three, why not, right? 
So that, that implies that C is equal to minus sine of pi over three. So what, what, what follows guys is that my function f of x is simply sine x minus sine of pi over three. And so f of pi over two is just sine of pi over two minus sine of pi over three, which is the shortcut, which is sine of x evaluated from pi over three to pi over two. You follow? Now, if you try to do it by Riemann sum, you will not be very successful because look at it. If the function is f of x equal to the integral from pi over three to pi over two, cosine x dx, your Riemann sum would be limit as n goes to infinity, summation k equal one to n of cosine of pi over three plus k, uh, the difference between pi over two and pi over three is, so just I'll just write it pi over two minus pi over three divided by n and uh, multiplied by pi over two minus pi over three divided by n. Now this limit to calculate directly is tremendously difficult. You understand? So I go around it. I, I don't carry this calculation. It's very difficult. So I go around it. I say, oh, what is this thing? I know that this function is an antiderivative of cosine. Yes, it's an antiderivative. So I should say here it's not x, but uh, here it is pi over two. It's another derivative of cosine. And I know that all antiderivative of cosine are like sine plus C. It's very important that I need to be sure that I did not miss any. There is no, there are no exotic antiderivatives. They all must look like sine. They can only be different by a plus a constant. And I, you have to understand that I hope. Yes, guys. All right. So here is what all of it means, guys. There is another thing that you can do is, for instance, and there was once a student that did not learn antiderivatives. Uh, and the way I asked the question on the exam, he was, he was clever enough to figure out to write uh, the correct answer without doing any work. So he got a hundred without doing any work whatsoever. And why? Because uh, for instance, uh, the question was uh, solve, you see this. And you know what the student did for, let's say for this, for the question A, the student uh, wrote this. He said, oh, this is, let's say zero to X cosine T dt plus C. And that's it. And I gave the student uh, 10 points for it. because the student did answer it. I mean, uh, this one, this means find all antiderivatives of cosine and he did. He just didn't express them in any simple, in this simple form. But the others, I mean, uh, you know, you, I appreciate that understanding, understood that this is the answer. Yes? Now, uh, this is this is what what a person can do. And so when I integrate e to the minus x squared dx, I can simply write maybe something like from zero to x e to the minus t squared dt plus c. It, it's just not always helping me because I cannot figure out uh, well, how to use this formula. So it's not easy to use. If I can find an, a nice looking antiderivative, I can use it much better, you understand? But it is a form, it's a, it's a perfectly valid form for antiderivative. Good? Now guys, uh, a very important last stretch. Take the derivative of those functions. Can you take the derivative of A? So such questions I believe uh, are very possibly on your exam.
All right, what, what's going on? Very good, uh, very good. So some of you see it, guys. What do you do here? So the derivative of, uh, of those functions, you just take the top number, you put it in and take the derivative of the top number, it's chain rule. It looks like the composition of this function with uh, x to the four, yeah? And when you take derivative of those types of functions of the cake function, uh, what happens is that the box becomes T. So when you take the derivative, it's going to be secant x to the power of four times four x cubed. That's it. It's chain rule. Derivative of the outer function, you just take this and replace T and then multiply by the derivative of, uh, of the numerator. I mean of uh, the upper part of the integral. Now B, please uh, take the derivative of that. Very good, uh, Humira, Christiana, and David. Very good. The answer is very right away, guys. X goes instead of T, so it's one over X cubed plus one. Yes? Now, can you take the derivative for C? Very good, Christiana. So first of all, guys, you should not be happy with X being on the bottom. So what do you do? You flip it around and you write it as minus integral pi to X root one plus secant T dt. And when you take the derivative of that, that becomes minus root one plus secant X. Good. Can you do D please?
Okay, guys. So D, so D, please fast. So what happens is again for D, I, I want this function to be on top. So I would write it as minus sine x. Here is one root of one plus d squared dt. The derivative is minus root one plus uh, sine squared x. Yeah. It's very, very quick if you understand what you're doing. Agreed? Now can you do E? It's when you want, I mean, Francis, you can go if you are tired. So how do you do E guys? Well, you can break it in the middle, right? You can break it with a point C. So it's the integral from cosine X. It doesn't matter where C is located of the function plus the integral of C to sine X of the function. You follow? And then I can take the derivative. It's a, a, a derivative of uh, uh, this part. Here, I'll, I'll write it. I'll, I'll show you below. Here, guys, you see, I can split it up like this for D. And then I, I, can, I can multiply by minus this one so that it will be on top. And here is what I get. I get uh, derivative of yeah, right? It's cosine of sine, so that uh, I will get top is sine to c, and then minus uh, c to cosine. And I take the derivative, and that would be ln of one plus two sine x times the derivative of sine plus uh, the der derivative here is it's minus ln one plus two cosine. Derivative of course n is minus sine, so that's where you get a plus. In general, if you have integral from ax to bx, you can split it apart and make it uh, the function at b times b prime minus the function at a, a prime. You can uh, quickly develop a formula so you don't have to waste time uh, splitting it up so long. Any questions on that, guys? Ask me questions, otherwise what's the point of me being here? 
You understand how that works? It's just chain rule and uh, properties of integration. I can split it, uh, the integral apart through a point C. And as we mentioned, the point C that doesn't have to be between AX and BX, it can be just any number. I split the integral and I take the derivative. Good? And finally, guys, if you understood this one, can you do this? Uh, can you do uh, F please? Let's do F and G. F guys was the derivative. Very good. Very good, Humira, David, and Zakaria. Good, Daryl. Very nice. Very good. So the answer is uh, naturally by this formula, just uh, plug this thing in and multiply by its derivative. Subtract and plug this thing in and multiply by its derivative. Here is the answer. Yes, guys, you can establish, just establish once why that works or establish it whenever you are unsure, understand what was the idea. We, we, we want to make the variable at the top of the integral sign and then take the derivative. But uh, once you get the, the idea, you can just do it faster. You can just skip that point and realize that the derivative is always plug the top function in and, uh, in and multiply by the derivative, plug the bottom function in, minus plug the bottom function in and multiply that by the derivative. Yes, then there is one more. Can you take the derivative of that? It doesn't matter V or T, you know, we just take the derivative of this expression.
It's a bit annoying to type it into the notes here. So here, let me show you what it becomes, guys. So what the last one, what last one it becomes is just uh, e to the tangent inverse of the full integral times the derivative of the integral. You see, so you just you take this, you plug it in here, and then times the derivative of that, which the derivative of the inner integral is simply cosine x squared. So it's this. Good. And now let's talk about why we change parameters. So uh, why do we write t instead of keeping it? Why not just a to x, f of x dx? Why do uh, a to x, f of t dt? Let's try to understand it by uh, looking at uh, two functions. You see, let's define capital F to be the type of function we defined, the cake function, and g of x to be, of, uh, to be like the cake function, but where x was not changed to a different letter. Yes? You understand? I'm just trying to show you the technical reason why do you change the letter. Now, what happens inevitably, if you were a computer, how would you understand uh, g? And how would you understand f? So for instance, what is f1, f2, f3? f1 is you replace each instance of x by one. So there is no instance of x here. So it's just a zero to one, zero to two, zero to three. That's if you do that with two and three respectively. Now, what happens if you change uh, the same thing in g? g of one is integral from zero to one of one squared. g of two is the integral from zero to two and of two squared. g of three, it's uh, and you replace instead of the x also three. You understand? I don't want to touch this. Uh, I just want to touch the bounds of integration. So here is the difference. Uh, f of x is the area under the curve because it's the area under under uh, t squared where this is t squared. Whereas g of x, it's a if this is x, g of x is the area of a rectangle. It's not area under the curve at all. It's just to integrate from zero to x of the function uh, x, squ x squared, of the, of the constant x squared. You see what I'm saying? So for instance, it's from zero to three of three squared or zero to two of two squared. Are you with me? I, I mean, just purely, uh, purely if you were a robot and you were tasked uh, to carry out uh, the operation uh, of g of one, g of two, g of, g of three, you would replace each instance of x, you see? So that means you see here you see an x, you put one, and here you see an x, you also put one. If you want to do it with two, you put two here, here, and here. And then you integrate an entirely different function. You understand? It just, it will be uh, just mechanically not working. So that's re replacing it in terms of t is to make sure that uh, like a computer will execute it correctly or that, that you, you communicate the idea correctly. So in particular, what is uh, f of x? f of x is one third x cubed. And uh, what is g of x? g of x is x times x squared. So g of x is just x cubed in this particular instance. So it's, uh, it's going to be an entirely different integral. Do you understand? I just hopefully uh, explain to you very quickly why do you need to change variables so that you can continue talking about. So you see, guys, very often you have something in your mind, but uh, because of incorrect speech, you communicate something other than what you had in mind. So in America, you use the word eat without stop. Eat, eat, eat. And you forget that it refers in your sentence to already, it changes meaning all the time, right? So similar thing is happening here. You have to be very careful so that you keep uh, uh, keep on top of meaning. Good, so then uh, let me just uh, ask you a few simple things, guys. Uh, here is uh, some four further questions that might help you uh, solve uh, something on the final. Suppose that you were asked to calculate this integral and try to calculate it as fast as you can, guys. You can use anything you, you like, but look at it. Question A, integral is from zero to one, root of one minus x squared, okay? Try to calculate this integral as quickly as you can. I will wait two minutes before telling you the answer, good? Starting now, guys, two minutes, go ahead.
All right, two minutes expired, correct? And guys, uh, let me see, did anybody solve it? Yes, a few people did. Uh, Faeza you did, uh, and uh, Christiania you did. And here is the idea, guys. Now, I am not integrating anything. You see, I'm asking what is somebody trying to find here? Instead of before I even go and try to calculate anything, like I ask myself, what is it that I, that I trying to find? Maybe there is a better way of doing it, faster way. Yes? So then what do I do for A? I realize what if I set Y equal to root of one minus X squared? That means that uh, Y squared is one minus X squared, which means X squared plus Y squared is one. I recognize that I'm dealing with circle and I know quite a lot about areas of circles. You agree? So first of all, it's positive root. So which means that I'm integrating over the upper part of the circle, the upper part of the circle. And overall, uh, the integral is from zero to one, not from minus one to one, which means I am integrating a quarter of a circle. You see, I'm finding the area of one quarter of a circle. And, that, and, the, and the circle is of radius one, so its uh, area is pi and pi divided by four is the area of the quarter. Agreed? So the answer without any calculation, guys, is one quarter pi. Can you now uh, solve the next question as quickly as possible? Question B. You can use anything you like, guys. You understand? You can use any technique you prefer but let's say your goal is to just answer correctly. Guys, why, why is it taking long? Uh, we can go over something there, okay? Uh, so uh, let's finish with these questions and then we can solve a few of the remaining questions if you have the energy for it. All right, so this you could of course do it by simply x squared divided by two minus x. You can just take the antiderivative or uh, you can notice area, guys. What is this in terms of area? This is, uh, if you break it apart, it's the area of X, which is a triangle, and the negative area of uh, a constant min of minus one. So it's area of triangle minus this area, which, uh, which gives you three halves. You follow? And uh, uh, then, of course, one last question, question number C, guys. What would you uh, like to do?
always have in the back of your mind, guys. Maybe something is very easy to calculate geometrically. Just if you understand what it is, I don't need to carry a calculation. I just know the answer. Yes? All right. Yes, yeah, so let's say, let's look at this picture. Here I drew it for you guys. So first of all, I can break the integral into the upper part of the circle from minus three to three, which is nine pi over two. The middle integral is zero because uh, it has negative and positive areas that cancel each other. And the last integral is 12 because it's just a rectangle. I don't even need to uh, do any antiderivatives, yes? So it's always useful to think, maybe it's possible to do this problem simply without, uh, or geometrically or anything like that. Okay, guys, uh, so let's now, uh, Christina, you can send me a link to the exam that, uh, in, the, in, the, in the text, uh, send me a link to the exam you were practicing and I'll try to see if I can help. All right, guys, are you ready? Let's look at that uh, exam. Which question? L1. And what about it? Well, I mean, they're obvious. I mean, uh, what happens here? Look at it. Uh, F becomes 12 and G becomes minus eight. So you plug in uh, 12 and minus eight. Here you plug in 12 and minus eight. Here you plug in uh, 12, I mean here. Oh, they all, there is only uh, this one that's a bit interesting. What's the answer for this one? Okay, so uh, the answer is one and you're absolutely correct. Christiana and Humira, the answer is one. Do you see why the answer is one? Because for, that's what I mean by understanding, guys. X going to three, doesn't matter. What, what happens is that uh, we have 12 minus tw uh, 12 and here 12 minus 12. The angles are 
essentially the same and they are going to zero. So it's like sine of an angle divided by the same angle and the answer is one. Do you all understand? It's sine x over x equal to one. That's all it is, guys. If you understand what it means, it's all it is. Yes, all of you understand? Where is... Um... Yeah, okay. Can we do u1 and uh, uh, and for d, uh, d, it's what's d? Is this D? Just uh, plug them in, I don't know. Just plug in X3 here and uh, for F you plug 12 and for G you plug minus eight. Yes, I mean, uh, it's it's a bit, and, and guys, do you realize I showed it if you watched or were present in the review on Sunday, you know that uh, you can type the solution without uh, actually calculating. You can just uh, type, uh, uh, for instance, I could I could type uh, I could type 12 cubed minus six times minus eight plus three cubed three squared sorry right I could just type it and and uh, the system will grade me as right as correct so don't waste time calculating anything uh, just just decide what's easiest to calculate or to plug the to just type it out we can go afterwards if you want to see, we can look a little bit on the website and uh, play with, the, with some questions there, it's similar questions to what we have. So uh, what other questions I was asked to do from this review list, please? Uh, U1. Where is your one? Isn't uh, you following R? Where is that? Page 13. And this is what page? Uh huh. All right, thank you. And let's see what we have. Uh, U1. Uh, so PT model uh, the population of the country in thousands T years after 2000. Let RT model the number of doctors in the country in thousands. Okay. What is the significance of uh, PT divided by, uh, by RT? Would anybody tell me what it means? So P is population, R is uh, doctors. So PT over RT means what, please? Ratio of people to doctors. In other words, how many people will one single doctor have to deal with? You understand? The real uh, the real problem is uh, H T over P T number of hypochondriacs divided by doctors. That's a much more important uh, ratio than this one. And then uh, uh, assume that P T exists for all T. Uh, can P T be ever negative? Can P prime of T be negative? Please help me. P prime of T, can it be negative? P prime T can, yes, right? So a P prime of T is the rate at which people behave like rabbits, reproduce, right? P prime of T is the growth of the population. So can it be negative? Yes, negative growth is technically possible. Not likely, but possible. You agree? So that means just uh, suddenly fewer people are born that are dying. Then uh, the population will shrink. Okay. Find an expression for uh, this uh, this thing. You, you know how to find the expression. It's just, uh, um, I don't need to do it. Yes, it's it's ratio test. I mean, it's a quotient rule. 
quotient rule. You agree? You just apply quotient rule and you have the formula. And then we have uh, all this information. Is it possible for uh, the derivative to be negative? Is it possible for this derivative to be negative? Very much possible. You know how it would be possible? Either, for instance, if the number of doctors uh, is getting larger than, it's basically doctors are growing more than uh, population, faster than population, that will be possible. Or population is decreasing and doctors are, are staying, the number of doctors stays the same, more or less, you know, right? It's possible, of course, right? If this ratio is, is, is decreasing, that means that fewer uh, people bother doctors. Understand? Fewer people per doctor. You know, it means you either have more doctors per population or you have less population per doctors. Okay, did we solve it? Wonderful. We didn't even have to do any calculations. Isn't it nice? Any other questions? Good. D3. D was above, I'm assuming. D3. Where is D3? Is, is this, is, this, is, this is D3, right? Here it is. All right, Jahin, uh, thank you for staying. Uh, thank you for your um, insightful comments. Good luck on the exam tomorrow if you're not staying. Uh, guys, here we have, uh, here we have this. Uh, find the derivative of f of x squared. Please type in the comments. Derivative of f x squared, type in the comments where it is. Derivative, you see, derivative of f prime is this, and you need to find derivative of f x squared. This is the prime, be careful. I myself can, because it's boring, I myself can accidentally make a mistake. All right, and the answer is very simply what? Uh, this expression, insert, insert x uh, squared, so it would be one plus x to the power of eight times two x, do you agree? The answer to this, let me write it. The answer to this question is what? It's two x root one plus x squared to the power of four, that's it. And which, which you can write as two times four is eight. So you can write it as two X root one plus X to the eight. Agreed? Anything else I can help with? Uh, you can put it afterwards. Uh, you can take the two X and put after, it's chain rule. Derivative of F X squared, the derivative of the outer function is root of something. Uh, and then you need to multiply by the derivative of x squared, that's two x, I just placed it in front. Related rate question, well, those are the, uh, usually the hardest and the least, uh, um, you know, useful to go over. I can if you want to, but it doesn't mean it will help you. So you want me to do which related rates? I recommend this, guys. So related rates are, are one of the more conceptual questions, yes? So uh, if, if it comes very, very, it's very difficult for you, focus on uh, other things. But I can uh, try to answer this question. Which, which question would you like me to go over? 
okay this one right okay suppose a tank leaks toxic chemicals Uh, the area affected is a circle centered on the tank. When the spill is first noticed, the circle has radius 5,000 feet. A response team arrives 30 minutes later, by which time the affected area has grown to a circle with radius of uh, um, 5,050 feet. Okay, so you understand what's happening, right? So you see that uh, the, resp the response team arrived. So, uh, so here is the, you have to understand this, this idea, guys. So first of all, we are watching a movie. For the purposes of mathematics, the movie we are watching is an expanded circle, expanding circle. You understand? I mean, all the other nonsense doesn't matter. I mean, it's a circle that's growing because it's not a real related rate. If you do physics, it will be more interesting. But here, uh, we just have a growing circle. And uh, what are we doing all about it? So uh, uh, yeah, when this, this spill is noticed, it's 5,000 uh, feet, you understand? So uh, it's just growing, but nobody pay attention. Now it's 5,000 feet. And then uh, uh, 30 minutes later, response team has arrived. And then uh, the area, uh, now notice the radius was this, and now the, the area of the circle uh, has radius uh, 50, 50, right? In other words, 5,050. How rapidly was the radius of the spill changing between the time the spill was noticed and the arrival of the response team. Do you understand the question? How fast was the radius uh, um, uh, changing? So again, the question is uh, uh, slightly vague in my opinion, because uh, the radius uh, might have been slowing down. It was not moving at a constant rate. You agree guys? Uh, all I can tell perhaps, I mean, perhaps they mean the average speed. The average speed, you see, so that's that's the question can be dangerous because I'm not sure what are they asking. The, the speed of the of the radius at some moment was faster. I presume, I guess, if it's a spill, it would be initially faster and towards the end, uh, when they did something with the response team arrived, 30 minutes later, the radius has been expanding slower. So uh, all I think is, okay, the radius changed by 50 feet, right? So I think it's uh, 50 feet divided by, uh, by, by 30 minutes, if I do it in hours, then divided by one half hour, if I do it in hour. So that would be 100 feet per hour would be average. It's not, uh, I, I, it's not this, the speed of it is not instantaneous. It's just on average, it was moving this way. You see guys, on average, in other words, if the speed were moving at a constant rate, then that's so it will be. Now, I don't know, let's see what, what's the next part of it. Good, so that's the uh, part of it here, we understood. How rapidly was the area of the spill changing between the time the spill was noticed and the arrival of the response team? So uh, the rapidity would be simply difference in area, so it's pi of uh, 50, 50 squared minus uh, pi of uh, 5,000 squared, you agree? And uh, this you can, you can factor out pi uh, divide, and this divided by, uh, by one half hour. Again, guys, uh, I'm assuming they want the information per hour, right? 30 minutes. I mean, it's very important to know in what units of time do you want information. Because if you don't know that, then you can put the wrong, an wrong answer to the computer, it would be wrong, good. So uh, it is uh, pi, and I, I can then see, I, it's, it's, uh, I can factor the difference of squared, so it will be, it is pi of uh, 50, pi, and here I have uh, 50, uh, times uh, the sum of them. So it's uh, uh, 5,000 plus 5,000 is 10,000. 10,050, yeah? 10,050, it's a product divided by uh, one half. In other words, it is, uh, it is uh, pi, times uh, two times 50 is 100 
times uh, 10,015. Okay, uh, you can multiply it uh, uh, now, and that's that's how many um, square feet per per hour. It's square feet per hour. How did I get 50? It's very simple. Look at it. I just factor it out. So this is like x squared minus y squared. So what I do is I say x minus y, x plus y. So I, I, 50 is it's this number minus that number. The second number is this number plus that number. I just uh, factored it out. You understand? Yes, guys. Are you with me? I just use difference of squares. I factored it out and made the, the calculation because I don't want to square one number then uh, subtract the square of another number. Doing it this way is easier. Again, Francis, uh, this is x squared minus y squared. And that's x minus y, x plus y. What is x? x is this number, y is this number. So I, here I take uh, this number minus that number and that's how I got 50. And then I and then for the second part multiply it by this number plus this number. That's how I got this number here, ten thousand fifty. And then uh, I multiply everything by two, and I have one hundred times uh, ten thousand fifty. And you can kind of just add the zeros. So it's pi times this number. Yes. Wonderful. Wonderful. And then what next? Uh, uh. So the response team plans to enclose the spill with a circular barrier if uh, it will take 90 minutes to set up the circular barrier, how long should it be? Defend your conclusion. Okay, well, I'm assuming that area is uh, moving at constant speed. You see guys, I mean, uh, the spill is coming out. If we assume the area is moving at a constant speed and we calculated that speed before, it takes them uh, 90 minutes. So all you have to do is uh, just, uh, uh, just, just set up equation, right? How much in 90 minutes, how bigger, how much uh, bigger should the uh, area be, right? So they, they want to know it will take 90 minutes to set the circle. How long should it be? the perimeter, this thing, right? So the perimeter should be um, two pi r, right? The perimeter should be two pi r and uh, that, that should be able uh, and when, in such a way that uh, pi r squared can enclose, uh, enclose the area at the moment when it's noticed, right? Uh, area at uh, this, the, the time they start plus uh, uh, plus the speed by which the area will grow, plus uh, sp uh, speed multiplied by uh, 90, 90 over 60 hours, if I do it in hours. That's the uh, formula. You understand? And you can solve for uh, uh, R based on that, right? So uh, pi r squared is, uh, is this combined area. So this should be equal to pi r squared. And then uh, what, what it means is that r is equal to uh, the previous result divided by pi and take the square root. Okay, I mean, I don't want to carry the calculations. You understand? I mean, just uh, take previous result, divide. So what's the area when you started? plus the speed uh, with which area will grow, that's how much area you will totally have, uh, times the time it will take them to set up the perimeter. Make sense? Are you with me guys, right? And then, uh, uh, then you figure out the uh, R and then multiply that by two pi and that will give you the length. Multiply that by two pi. Uh, which will simply be, uh, well, yeah, you can multiply it, but it, it, it will be this, this thing. Good. So we calculated the speed before, this is the time and uh, we need to know how much area at the start and that's your formula. One second. 
Ну, хватит приключений. Новая, да? All right, uh, yes, guys, I should, uh, well, and then hopefully that's enough for you. I think I need to get going. Uh, all right, they're all, let's do that. Good luck with you guys. Uh, take care tomorrow. Don't cheat. That's all I'm asking. Right? Uh, try to do all. Well.